present Arthur Lowe, John LeMessurier, and Clive Dunn in Dad's Army. <laughs> Branded, featuring John Lorry, Arnold Ridley, and Ian Lavender with this week's guests, Bill Pertwee and Nan Braunton. <laughs> Here is the news, and this is John Snag reading it. The war in Europe continues, and the tramp, tramp, tramp of the Nazi jackboot strikes terror into the hearts of the people in the occupied countries. But here in Great Britain, those fearless men of the Home Guard make it their constant resolve that never shall our streets echo to that dreaded goose step. In his office at the church hall in Warmington-on-Sea, Captain Mannering is busy reading a letter while Sergeant Wilson takes the evening's parade. All right, I'll pay attention. Now, tonight, we're going to do some stalking. Stalking? Yes, yes. stalking. That's what we're going to do, some stalking. In other words, how to creep up behind an enemy sentry in the dark. Stalking. Well, it may interest you all to know that I am an expert stalker. Really, John? Uh Uh-huh. At one time, I was considered one of the finest stalkers in the country. I bet you were quite a chatterbox in the town. (laughs) I saw that in last week's Beano. (laughs) Be quiet, Frank. Sorry, Aunt Arthur. Well, Fraser, as you seem to know something about this, perhaps you could sort of, uh, you know what I mean, sort of... Put us in the picture. Oh, I'll do that. Aye. Now, <clears throat> you must always remember to approach your quarry from behind. And all the time, you keep downwind of him. Why'd you do that, Mr. Fraser? So that he doesn't get your scent. But what if you're not wearing any scent? <laughs> I'm talking about human scent, son. Oh, see? Now, when you're creeping up behind a sentry, you have to pick your feet up and put them down very carefully. It's most important that you watch where you're putting your feet. Like when you're crossing a field of cows. Frank, <laughs> <laughs> right, I shan't tell you again. No, no. Now, we'd uh, better have someone to creep up upon. I didn't like to volunteer for that, Sergeant Wilson. I'd like to be the someone you creep up upon. No, 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 Jonesy, you're always volunteering. We'd, we'd better have someone else to take the enemy sentry's part. I'd like to do it, Sergeant. I'd like to do it. I'd like to take the enemy sentry's part. Yes, and WC, we must give some of the others a chance. Uh, now, wait a minute. Uh, uh, Godfrey? Uh, uh, yes, Sergeant? Well, you can be the enemy sentry. Uh, let's see, you'll need something to sit on. I'd like to volunteer to be the something to sit on, sir. <laughs> Jones, please. Wilson, come here a minute, would you? All right, sir, I'm coming. You wanted me, sir? Yes. T- close the door. Uh, I'd like you to read this. Hmm? But it's addressed to you, sir. I know, I know that. Read it. Funny. It's from Godfrey. Why did he write you a letter? You'll soon find out. To Captain George Mannering, officer commanding the 1st Platoon, Warmington on Sea Home Guard. Dear sir, it is with much regret that I must tender to you my resignation. Owing to personal reasons, I feel that I can no longer remain as a member of the platoon. Therefore, I must ask you to accept my two weeks' notice. <laughs> That's from the end of the week. I remain, dear sir, your obedient son, Charles Godfrey. Hmm. Well? Well, it's a pity he's going, sir. I mean, we shall, we shall miss him. What do you mean, it's a pity he's going? He can't leave, just like that. Well, I don't see how I can stop him, sir. I mean, he's given you two weeks' notice. This is war, Wilson. <laughs> Not the army and navy store. <laughs> Better go and get him. Find out what all this is about. All right, sir. <clears throat> now, let's have a look at this rotor. Monday. Well, one six, no patrol, gas works, river bridge, telephone exchange... At 2250, Godfrey puts on kettle. (laughs) 2258, Godfrey makes tea. Ready for return of patrol at 2300 hours. Tuesday, number three, section patrol, novelty rock emporium. Godfrey leaves here at 2330. Arrives, novelty rock emporium, 2350. Makes tea. Ready for arrival of patrol at 2400 hours. Oh, no, no. I couldn't possibly let him go. He's far too valuable. <laughs> Come in. I've got Private Godfrey, sir. You wanted to see me, sir? Yes, Godfrey. Sit down, will you? Oh, well, thank you. You too, Wilson. Oh, thanks, officer. 
Now then, Godfrey, what's the idea of this letter? Well, I'm afraid it means that I, I've got to leave, sir. You mean that you feel that you're getting a little too old for active service, is that it? Well, uh, no, not really, sir. And what's the matter? Well, I got up the other morning slightly earlier than usual. Mind you, I usually get up around about 7.30. You see, I always make the early morning tea and then I take a cup up to my sister Sissy. Until quite recently, we've always had a special brand of tea from the Army and Navy stores, but, of course, it's, it's on such short ration now that, that to put up anything we can get. Yes, I quite agree with you, my dear fellow, sir. Some of the stuff we've been getting lately is terrible. All those nasty little bits of tea dust floating on the top. Yeah, Wilson tea. <laughs> but, Godfrey, I, <clears throat> I don't quite see what this has got to do with leaving the platoon. Oh, I'm coming to that, sir. Oh, let me see now. Where was I? You were just going to make the early morning tea. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> when I went into the larder to get the milk, and then I saw something that made me realize that I just couldn't carry on. What on earth was that? A mouse. <laughs> mouse? Yes. You see, in the larder was a great big empty pudding basin. A mouse had fallen inside, and it was running round and round trying to get out. I knew I ought to kill it because we were overrun with mice. So I got hold of it, and, and as I held it in my hand, I could feel its little heart beating under its fur. I, I just couldn't bring myself to do it. What did you do? I took it out of the garden and let it go. Look, G Godfrey, I still don't see what this has got to do with your wanting to leave the platoon. Now, don't you understand, sir? If I couldn't bring myself to kill a little mouse running round that bow, how could I ever kill a German? Well, you're hardly likely to come across a German running round in a pudding basin. <laughs> <laughs> Wilson, I find your public school humour rather irritating at times. <laughs> Sorry, sir. But, Godfrey, if you feel as you do, why did you join the Home Guard in the first place? Well, when the Home Guard was first started, sir, things were so desperate, I somehow felt different from the last time. The things are still desperate, Godfrey. Hitler could invade at any moment. And we need every man we can get. What, what did you mean when you said that you felt differently from last time? Well, you see, sir... During the last war, I was a conscientious objector. A what? A conscientious objector. A con... A con... I can't even bring myself to say the word. You mean you didn't want to fight? Uh, not really, sir. I can't believe this, Godfrey. I really can't. I... I think the best thing that you can do at the moment is to go home. Very good, sir. Now, are you sure you don't want me for anything else this evening? No, I don't. Just go. I'm sorry about this, Mr. Manning. I really have enjoyed being with you all. I, I can only hope that during my service I've given every satisfaction. Oh, get out, man. Yes, sir. Well, don't you think you're being a little bit harsh, sir? Harsh? Hmm. Harsh, Wilson? All this time you've been... Harboring a damn conscience in our ranks. And you tell me I'm being harsh? Well, after all, sir, a man must follow the dictates of his conscience. Where would the country be today if we all felt like that, eh? Just, just supposing that, that, that you'd finished work at the bank one afternoon. And you went round to have tea with Mrs. Pike. And when you got there, you found a Nazi stormtrooper forcing his attentions on her. What would you feel like then, eh? Oh, really, sir? Ah, that strikes home, doesn't it? That really cuts to the bone. Well, that's, that's rather an old-fashioned argument, don't you think, sir? Perhaps I am old-fashioned, Wilson. I just can't stand cranks. Fancy not wanting to fight. <laughs> it isn't normal. <laughs> but, with anything else, what are they going to say at GHQ when they find out? Oh, need they find out, sir? Well, I shall have to put a report in about it. Then what are they going to say? It should be known as... Captain Mannering's company of cowards. Well, what are you going to do about him then, sir? I know what I'd like to do. I'd like to give him the rogue's march. What? What on earth's that? Oh, they used to do that in the British Army many years ago. If a man was a coward and had brought disgrace on his regiment, they would parade him in front of the men, tear the gold braid off his hat, cut off his epaulets, tear off his medals, and break his sword. It'd be rather difficult to do that to Godfrey, sir. He's only wearing denim. Yes, all right. <laughs> Get the men afraid. Well, what are you going to say to them, sir? I'm going to tell them the truth. 
I may not be able to cut off Godfrey's epaulets in front of the men physically, but I can do it verbally. Junzi, Junzi, what's all the mystery about? Don't ask me, Mr. Fraser. All I know is we were told to fall in for a special parade. Mr. Manning's got a very important announcement to make. Uh By the way, anyone seen Godfrey? Yes, I have. He left about half an hour ago. As he passed me, I said, where are you going, Mr. Godfrey? And he didn't even answer. I think he had tears in his eyes. Yeah, he's he's as soft as a cream puff. (laughs) If I was in manning shoes, I'd give him something to cry about. Hey, look. Sergeant Wilson's got the beer crate. Captain Manning only stands on that for very important speeches. <laughs> Here we are. <clears throat> How's that, sir? A little more to the left, Wilson. Uh, Hello. Right, sir. Do you need any help to get on it? No, thank you. <laughs> Bring the men to attention. Right, sir. Turn. Turn. Attention. Right, gentlemen. Stand at ease. Now, men, during the 14 months we've been together, and 14 very rewarding months... Shift over there. Come on, make way. We have had to put up... Here. ...with many trials... Here. ...tribulations. Here, you. Warden, do you mind not prodding me? You going to be long? I don't know. I've got something very important to say to the men. Oh, have you? Well, so have I. Here. We have had to Sergeant Wilson, what's Napoleon going on about then? Got something very important to say to the man. Why is he standing on a box? Well, well the, uh, is that the only way you can get them to look up to him? <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Look, look, I can't hang about all day, mate. I was asked to come along and explain about the civil defence exercise on Saturday afternoon. It's a special smoke test. You'll enjoy that. Yes, well, you just have to wait. Oh, we'll soon see about that. Shift over. I want those beer crates. If he's got one, I'm going to have two. Look out, mate. One. Two. What are you doing up there, Hodges? Ha-ha! Now then, who's king of the castle? <laughs> there was a brave old Scotchman at the Battle of Waterloo. The wind blew up his petticoats and showed his... Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> Um, um, sorry, Mr. Fraser, I, I forgot you were there. For your information, laddie, the word is Scotsman. Scotch is something you drink. And uh, I can't understand, man, why, why you English have such an obsession with what us Scots wear and their old kilts. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a bit chilly out tonight. Yeah, hello, Mr. Jones. I see you got the tea ready, Pikey. There's a good boy. Pour us out the cup. All right. There you are, Mr. Jones. Yeah. Mr. Fraser? Oh, thank you, son. Oh, here, yeah, Parky, what do you put in this tea? Why, don't you like it? Well, not as good as Mr. Godfrey made. Don't! Let's run that name to me. Just fancy all this time we've, we've had a country in our ranks without knowing it. What's going to happen to him, Mr. Jones? Well, you heard what Mr. Manning said at the parade. He's going to make him stay with the platoon until he can find somebody to replace him. So don't write this grace. It's a disgrace. My mum thinks men ought to be men. I heard her telling my Uncle Arthur. (laughs) She's quite right, Mum. Quite right. I feel a bit sorry for him, though. What, What do you think, Mr. Jones? Well, I don't know much about conscientious objecting. I've been a soldier all my life. Ours is not the reason why. Ours is but to do or die. I can remember once when we was on the northwest frontier. Oh, for God's sake, no again. <laughs> northwest frontier of what, Mr. Jones? Northwest frontier of India. We were surrounded by hundreds of Pathans. You mean those black men with turbans? No, they're not black. They're the same colour as you, Pikey. And they've got hawk like faces with hooked noses and, and cruel beady eyes. A bit like Mr. Fraser. Yeah. <laughs> oh, come to think of it, he does look like a baton. Don't talk rubbish, man. Anyway, we were surrounded by hundreds of batons. It was freezing cold, and there was icicles hanging all round the side of the fort. And these batons kept charging at us. Fast as we shot them, more took their place. In the end, we got no more bullets left. So what did we do? You broke off the icicles and used them for bullets. How did you know that, John? <laughs> Because we've heard the story about 20 times already. Mr. Jones, if you fired the icicles, well, surely the heat of the rifle must have melted them. 
Ah, but you see, when they travel through the cold air, they froze again. <laughs> You're going to sport my story now, Mr. Fraser. Anyway, hence the expression, keep your powder dry. Yeah. Now, if you want to hear a true story, it was the last war during the Battle of Jutland. I was down below when we were struck by a torpedo and badly holed. The water was rushing in, so I docked quickly. I tore off my jacket, shoved it in the hole. That was near enough. I tore off my trousers and shoved them in the hole. That was near enough. Then I tore off my shirt and my underpants and shoved them in the hole. Still no good. So I tore off my socks and shoved them in the hole. And that did the trick. <laughs> Hence the expression, put a shot in it. <laughs> <laughs> you stupid old gummerel. <laughs> Am I too late to make the tea? Oh, yes, yes. I made it, Mr. Godfrey. We didn't think you were coming. All of a sudden, there's a very nasty smell in here. <laughs> Come on. It's time to get back on the troll. Yeah. Come on, Parky. I brought some upside down cakes. My sister made them specially. Would anyone like one? What about you, Mr. Jones? No, I'm, uh, I'm not, not hungry, thank you. Frank, uh, would you like one? Oh, thank you, Mr. Godfrey. Ah, don't you dare touch that cake, Pike. Come on. Oh, dear. I can't take them back. Sissy will be upset. I'd better try and eat them myself. I hope this smoke test isn't going to be too much for Mannering's lot, Mr. Hodges. Oh, you needn't worry about that, Fred. They're dead keen. Anyway, I'll keep an eye on them. All the same, don't put too many rags in the stove. You don't want them cool coming out looking like old Jolson. <laughs> right. Look out. Here comes Napoleon. Left. 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 Right. Left. Return. Halt. That out is. Afternoon, Mr. Hodges. We're all ready for you. Right. Now, listen. This afternoon, we're going to do rescuing an unconscious person from a burning building. Now, this hut here is full of smoke. We've been burning damp rags in this stove here, and the smoke's going through this pipe here to the hut over there. Right. Have you got that? Oh, I have. Right. Now, when you get inside the hut, you'll find sacks filled with straw. They represent the bodies. You get hold of one and go out the flat the other side. When you get outside, there's a wall with a ladder against it. You carry the body up the ladder and over the wall. What about the smoke? No, you leave that behind. <laughs> <laughs> now, I mean, we shall suffocate. My mum wouldn't like that. She's quite fond of me. Oh, you won't suffocate. <laughs> you won't suffocate if you do it properly. I'll just show you. Now, watch me very carefully. Now, you get down like this, right? On your hands and knees, right? With your face close to the ground. What, like a bloodhound? <laughs> You try to be funny. That'll do, Pike. Sir. Right. As you all know, smoke always rises. So there is a small area of two inches from the ground, which is smoke-free. Now, what you do is this. You get your nose flat on the floor, like this. And keep your mouth tightly shut. Now, the fresh air goes up through your nostrils. So now, uh, now it's clear. See? Now, you crawl along like this. Watch. Now, whatever you do... Don't lift your nose off the floor. You can see by the shape of it, he's done a lot of practicing. <laughs> the Mr. speaks up. Yes, Jim. Well, sir, that's all very well, but supposing your nose is longer than two inches. You're <laughs> For your information, Jones, my nose is not longer than two inches. No, 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 sir, no. Well, when Jones said your nose, he wasn't referring to your actual nose. He was talking about a hypothetical nose. <laughs> Sir Ronald de Bergerac had a very long nose. Uh, he wouldn't have got through. Oh, well, just as well you didn't bring him, then. <laughs> what about Mr. Fraser? It's not going to be easy for him. His nose is longer than two inches. Oh, no, it's not. It's not. <laughs> Well, we soon tell the tip of my thumb to the second joint is exactly two inches. I think you've got this thumb out of my nose. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, you're trying to help. I don't think it's going to work, you know, Mr. Mannering. Excuse me, Mr. Hodges. 
Has the hut got a wooden floor? Yes, it has. Ha- yes, it has. Why? <laughs> my mum wouldn't like the idea of me pushing my nose along the floor. I might get a splinter in it. <laughs> Darby City. Well, don't let that worry you, lad. Don't give it a moment's thought. If you like, I'll put a ruddy carpet down. All right, all right. Don't swear at my memory, so I'll just swear enough to make anyone swear. I'm trying to give a lecture, and all they can do is to argue about their noses. You lot don't realise how lucky you are to be allowed to go through a smoke-filled hut. There's plenty of people who just can't wait to go through one. Don't get on with it. <laughs> now, now, this bit can be dangerous, so pay attention. You will observe this flap ear. There is also one at the other end of the hut. You all go in through this flap ear. All right? Right. 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 Now, my assistant will go round to the other flap and count you off as you come through the other end. If any one of you doesn't appear, I shall come straight in and get you out. And don't forget, once inside, each of you must pick up a sack of straw, representing the body. OK? Right. All right, Fred. Off you go. And don't forget, there's 17 to come through. 17. right oh, Mr Hodges. And give us a shout when you're in position. Right. Right, Mr Benry. Now, you can get ready to start sending your men through. Just a minute. I'm going through first. I don't expect my men to do anything that I can't do. Do you think that's wise, sir? Just stand by and send the rest of them through, Wilson. Ready when you are, Mr. Hodges? Right, Fred. Number one coming through. Off you go, Manry. Right, here you go. I should like to volunteer to be the next one to go through the smoke-filled hut, Sergeant Wilson. <laughs> all right, all right, then. Right. I'm off, then. Oh, out of the way, Jones. Oh, hello, Mr. Manring. I thought you'd gone. Here, Manring, what are you doing coming back? You'll mess up all my counting. I can't help that. There's not enough smoke in there. Fred, cancel that. He's come back. Right, Mr. Hodges. What are you playing at, Manring? Stand aside, Hodges. You need a lot more rags on this stove. Right, Jones, start taking the men through. Very good, sir. I'm going now. You'll asphyxiate them. If a thing's worth doing, it's worth doing properly. I hope you know what you're doing, Manring. Anyway, keep sending them through with their straw bodies. I'm going round the other end of the up. Right, Jones is gone. You follow him, Fraser. Aye, ready, right sir. And then Sponge, Hancock, White, stand by, ready to go. How's it going, Fred? Well, they're coming through OK, Mr. Rogers. Here's one now. <laughs> oh, hello, Mr. Jones. <laughs> oh, I'd have to go back. I've forgotten my body. <laughs> I shouldn't have thought a body like yours is worth remembering. <laughs> That's insinuation, that is. I was talking about my bag of straw. Oh! What's the matter with you, Jock? I've got a splinter up my nose. Oh, that's too bad, isn't it? I told you, Mr. Fraser, you should have let me measure your nose properly. I thought it looked longer than the specified two inches. Stop blathering, come on. Here, come on, you two, come on, clear out the way. Come on, up the ladder and over the wall, will you? Come on now. Just a moment, just a moment. Don't start handling me. You remember you're a civilian. So what? So keep a civilian tongue in your head. (laughs) Come on, Jock, let's go. Are you keeping the moving, Fred? Yes, Mr. Rogers. Are there many more to come, Mannerin? No, nearly all gone. Off you go, Pike. Right home, Mr. Mannerin. All right, Godfrey. You're not getting out of this. I wasn't trying to get out of it, Mr. Manning. You'd like to, though, wouldn't you? Now, you go first. And remember, I'm right behind you. So don't try any of your conchy tricks on me. (laughs) Last man going in now, Hodges. Right you are. How many have you counted, Fred? There's a lot more smoke than usual, isn't there? It's that Captain Manning. He's a ratty hooligan. He's putting more rags on the stove. Come on, Wilson. Hurry up and get over that wall. Just clear off, will you? (laughs) Oh, oh, Mr. Hodges. What do you want me to do with this sack of straw? Don't tempt me, boy. <laughs> Just carry it and yourself over the wall. Go on, get along with you. That's 15 now. Right, only two more to come then. You can follow the others over the wall now, Fred. Right you are, Mr. Hodges. <coughs> Is this it? Oh, yes, you made it then, Grandpa. <laughs> Where's Captain Mannering? <coughs> Just behind me. Right, well, I'm going over the wall. <laughs> you can wait here for him. Very well. <coughs> that's, that's funny. It was just behind me. I, I wonder what's keeping him. I, I hope nothing's happened to him. Mr. Manley, <coughs> are you in there? Oh, dear. <coughs> what have I where to do? Mr. Hodges, Mr. Manley hasn't come out yet. <coughs> I shall... Just have to go in and get him. 
All right, Mr. Manley. <coughs> I'm coming. Sit forward a bit, Charles, and let me straighten your pinholes. There we are. Oh, oh, thank you, sissy. Does my brother have to have special food, doctor? No, no. He'll be as right as rain in a day or two, Miss Godfrey. Uh, just see that he gets plenty of rest. Thank you, doctor. And is it all right for Mr. Mannering and his friends to come in now? Yes, of course. Uh, so long as they don't overexcite him. Well, I'll uh, see myself out. Thank you, doctor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Mannering. Good afternoon, Doctor. My brother will see you now, Mr. Mannering. Thank you, Miss Godfrey. Hello, hello there. Uh, Mr. Hello, Godfrey. Godfrey. Hello. Uh, Godfrey. Are you feeling better? Yes, thank you, sir. There's some flowers for you, Mr. Godfrey. Oh, oh, my favourite, sweet peas. <laughs> and I've brought you some sweet breads. They'll make you nice and strong, they will. And, uh... Here's a, here's a half bottle of scotch for you. <laughs> Thank you so much. You mustn't encourage him to drink, must we? Purely medicinal, Mum. Purely medicinal. Well, sir, aren't you going to thank him for saving your life? Yes, yes, of course I am. <clears throat> now, look, Godfrey, I, uh, I may have said a few harsh things in the past, but uh, I want you to know that deep down I... I uh, <clears throat> What's, what's this photograph of a soldier in uniform? Is this you, Godfrey? Uh, yes, sir, yes. It was taken in the last war. If my eyes don't deceive me, you're wearing the military medal. Uh, yes, I know. But you told me that you were a damn... Co that you were a conscientious objector. Well, so I was, sir. And how did you win the M.M.? He volunteered as a medical orderly. My brother wouldn't tell you himself, Mr. Mannering. He's much too modest. But during the Battle of the Somme... He went out into no man's land under heavy fire and saved several lives. <laughs> it was nothing, really. <laughs> I had no idea. Now, I'm, I'm sure we're all very sorry we've stood upon you in false judgment, Mr. Godfrey. Yes, 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 we are. yes, yes indeed. Yes. Uh, speaking for myself, I never doubted you for a single moment. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps in future, sir. Godfrey could be our medical orderly. Ah, thank you, Wilson. Yes, that's an excellent idea. As from today, Godfrey, you're appointed platoon medical orderly. Report back as soon as you're fit. Oh, thank you, sir. Oh, we mustn't tire you anymore. Goodbye, Godfrey. Uh, goodbye, sir. Well, before I go, there's, there's still one thing that I don't understand. Uh, what's that, sir? Why you never wear your medals? Well, uh, somehow I think they look rather ostentatious, sir. Ostentatious? <laughs> Good Lord, man. If I'd have won the military medal, I'd have worn it proudly on my chest for all the world to see. Oh, yes, sir. That would have been all right, sir, because well, somehow you look like a hero. That's goes to show, doesn't it, sir? You should never judge by appearances. <laughs> That episode of Dad's Army, based on the original television series by Jimmy Perry and David Croft. You heard Arthur Lowe's Captain Mannering, John LaMajor Sergeant Wilson, Clive Dowden Corporal Jones, John Laurie Private Fraser, Arnold Ridley Private Godfrey, Ian Lavender the Private Pike, Bill Pertwee, Chief Warden Hodges, Nan Braunton, Sissy Godfrey, Michael Siegel, Second Warden, and Norman Ettlinger as the Doctor. Branded was adapted for radio by Michael Knowles and Harold Snowd, and produced by John Dyess. <laughs> <laughs>